Hello, it's April 5th. This is Matthew Ogden with an LPAC breaking news report. As Sky Shields revealed during the LPAC weekly report last Wednesday, and as we have elaborated on this site since then, recent phenomena observed in the supposedly stable Crab Nebula, which are completely inexplicable from the standpoint of accepted bottom-up physics, has proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that all popularly accepted opinion in science must now be overthrown. We are observing phenomena which operate according to completely different laws than what we normally accept as an abiotic physics. This idea that the universe is not a single homogeneous space-time, but that you have the interaction between different types of spaces governed by the presence of different principles, also applies to phenomena that we observe right here on Earth. For example, the difference between life and non-life. Recent discoveries in that domain have also been made, which have been published in a newly released report by German and Israeli scientists on chirality and biotic space-time, which serve to challenge and totally repudiate the enforced bottom-up scientific ideology which has been heretofore dictated from the reigning scientific elites. The idea which Vladimir Vernatsky eventually developed into his idea of the three unique but mutually interacting phase spaces of the abiotic, biotic, and noetic, an idea which is crucial for the modern science of physical economics, had its origins in crucial work which the French scientist Louis Pasteur did at the end of the 19th century, in which he showed that living processes possessed a unique state of space all their own. Pasteur's work was based on the observed chirality or preferential rotation of polarized light when channeled through a substance composed of molecules derived from living matter, as opposed to an indifferent absence of such chirality when light was projected through non-living or abiotic matter. This evidence was of crucial importance for Vernadsky, as he cataloged all of the unique observable phenomena which indicated the material energetic boundary between life and non-life. Vernatsky, however, taking Pasteur's discovery one step further, hypothesized that as man's sensorium was extended further and further into the small through increasingly sensitive measuring equipment, this chirality, or unique spatial characteristic of living molecules, would be observed even at the much smaller atomic level. Vernatsky even speculated that the phenomenon of mass-independent isotope selection, or fractionation, exhibited by life, unexplainable up to now, might be related to a possible resonance of isotopes with Pasteur's chiral molecules. This hypothesis was featured in a report by LaRouche Pack basement team member Megan Roulard, called Isotopes and Life, Considerations for Space Colonization, published as a part of a package on cosmic radiation in the summer of last year, in which she discussed the likelihood that precisely this sort of atomic chirality of living matter would be discovered, were this phenomenon hinted at by just a handful of provoking experiments to be investigated more seriously. That report was informed by Vernatsky's own ideas, as referenced by Megan. Vernatsky wrote in his book The Biosphere, originally published in 1926, It is very likely that isotopes and the symmetry of atoms play roles in the living organism which have not yet been elucidated. And in a work titled Isotopes and Living Matter, also published in 1926, which a LaRouche Pack basement research team translated for the first time from the Russian just last year, Vernatsky indicates that there should be considerations beyond merely molecular symmetry, which serve as unique indicators of life's physical space-time, down to the atomic level. The empirical material of geochemistry makes it possible to assert that some difference in the chemical elements of living and inert matter ought to be located in the domain where atomic forces, rather than molecular, are manifested. This hypothesis, which Vladimir Vernatsky made 85 years ago, and which Louis Pasteur had a prescience of over 100 years ago, has now been verified in this new study just published by a group of German and Israeli scientists called Spin Selectivity in Electron Transmission Through Self-Assembled Monolayers of Double-Stranded DNA. In this report, 
This group of scientists demonstrate that a highly selective polarization of spin phenomenon was observed in the photoelectrons reflected from a gold plate coated in the DNA of organic matter upon exposure to directed light, as opposed to a bare metal plate without the presence of organic matter, in which case no spin selectivity is exhibited in the reflected photoelectrons when measured with a polarimeter. The scientific team reports, photoelectrons emitted from a bare gold substrate upon exposure to linearly polarized light would not be expected to show spin polarization. However, we observed exceptionally high polarization of electrons ejected from surfaces coated with a self-assembled monolayer of double-stranded DNA, independent of the polarization of incident light. By directly measuring the spin of the transmitted electrons with a Mott polarimeter, we found spin polarizations exceeding 60% at room temperature. What these graphs indicate is that while you see a completely unpreferential photoelectric characteristic from the bare metal plates with polarized light, whether it be linearly polarized or circularly polarized in the clockwise or counterclockwise direction, being reflected as photoelectrons, which have a spin equal to that of the incident light. However, when that metal surface is covered in organic matter, the incident light, whatever its initial polarization, is reflected consistently in all cases as photoelectrons with a clockwise directed spin polarization. What becomes obvious from these experiments is that the preference of life for left polarization trumps the polarity of the incident light. Whether it is linear, clockwise, or counterclockwise, life transforms it into a clockwise polarity in the same exact way that the living molecules exhibited a predominantly left-handed chirality in Louis Pasteur's original studies. This shows that a resonance with chirality exists even at a level below the molecular, indicating that this specific phenomenon is indeed a space-time characteristic, extending into the very small, with organic DNA itself exhibiting chiral properties, and is not just a quirk exhibited at the molecular level. What's more, the kind of chiral selectivity observed here in the presence of life under so-called normal conditions, at room temperature, etc., can only be artificially induced in non-living matter under extreme conditions of extreme cold or through the application of a strong magnetic field, and even in these cases, exhibit mere approximations of the phenomena which occur easily under so-called normal conditions for life. You see that there exists a state of space outside of non-life, which the abiotic can only brush up against at its infinities or extremes. This, therefore, serves to validate not only Vernatsky's hypothesis of separate and distinct states of organized space, but also underscores the nested hierarchical quality of these phase spaces, in which one phase space is so-called higher or more powerful than another. The implications of this idea completely overturn today's bottom-up approach to physical science, and also are critical in epistemological importance when extended to the science of noetically dominated human physical economics. Now come back to the specific challenge which humanity is facing at this specific moment in galactic time. As Lyndon LaRouche indicated recently, it is from this standpoint, and this standpoint alone, the Vernatskian point of view, that man will be able to survive the upcoming period of increased galactic activity. As we move into a period of intensified solar activity, and more broadly as our solar system moves towards the exposed northern side of our galaxy, we will be required to come to understand this hierarchy of creative principles and the responsibility which comes to man from that standpoint. That in the same way that the living domain has the power to reorganize the processes of the lower abiotic domain, man's noetic powers give him the responsibility to understand and harness both the living and abiotic processes of these two lower domains, on the scales of both the very small and the very, very large. 
As we find ourselves in the midst of increased seismic activity along the Pacific Rim of Fire, and as we find ourselves confronted with the urgent necessity to begin to more accurately forecast these phenomenal and destructive events, case after case we are beginning to find those answers in the extrasensory electromagnetic cosmic radiation domain. This